Good morning, boys and girls. It's uh, good to be here with you again today. I'm excited to get into our lesson this morning and, and uh, sing with you again and, and pray with you. Um, I'm grateful to God that we can just continue to uh, meet in this way and, and have the uh, children's uh, lesson time together. Uh, as we uh, get started, I'd like to go ahead and open with prayer and uh, ask God to bless our time and, and take an opportunity to, uh, to pray for you as well. So let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, let's quiet our lips, and let's ask the Lord uh, for help now. Father, thank you for uh, the great privilege and blessing that we have to gather uh, together this, this morning. Uh, thank you that uh, we can lift our voices to you, um, not just in song, Lord, but in prayer, uh, as we worship through prayer, uh, knowing that um, you are uh, a God who is, is holy and righteous, and yet we can come to you because of what Jesus Christ, our King, has done uh, for us. And uh, he has made a way for us. We no longer have to come to you through um, a temple that is blocked with a, a, a large, great veil that separates us, Father. Uh, that veil has been torn, and we now have direct access to you because of the righteousness of Christ, because of the blood that he shed on, on the behalf of us and on our behalf. And um, so I pray uh, right now that we would turn our minds and our attention uh, to focus solely upon you, Father. Uh, they should, our attention should always be upon you, but um, especially now as we open your word, as we sing, uh, may we uh, allow our focus and our gaze to be upon you, that you would be rightly worshipped, rightly glorified and exalted right now. Uh, thank you for your love for us. Help us to worship you well, even right now as we sing and as we um, study your word, um, help the children to not be distracted, but to focus upon you and you alone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right, we're going to uh, continue to sing our song, You Are My God, together. So uh, let's get ready to sing, boys and girls. If you have the words with you, uh, get those out, and let's do this, um, uh, do this at least one more time. Um, I look forward to singing uh, together with you this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. You, my God, and I will give thanks to you. You, my God, and I will extol you. steadfast love endures forever oh good thanks to the lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever oh good thanks to the lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever you are my god and i will give thanks to you you are my god and i will extol you steadfast love endures forever oh give 
thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever all right well I hope that you have enjoyed learning that song as much as I have um, that Psalm 118 1 uh, what a what a blessed psalm, and uh, what a privilege for us to be able to sing that together, um, uh, the, those truths of, of the steadfast love that endures forever, that, that steadfast love of God. And uh, boys and girls, that's a, an amazing truth that we can hold on to and, and know that God, um, in His love, in His patience, it endures forever. But we know that um, that, that even that patience and that long suffering that the Bible calls it, um, that one day all, all will be judged. But we know because of his steadfast love that he has called some to be his children and he will save those whom he has called. And, and um, I pray for you that, that God would be gracious to you and provide you the faith to believe upon Him, to call upon His name, that you would be saved, so that in that day when that judgment comes, you would be His children. And boys and girls, we are going to talk about that King this morning, that mighty King that will come, King Jesus, uh, because that's, that's one of our questions, and the big question that we were answering right now is, who is our King? And that is King Jesus. And, but this morning, we're also going to talk about Another king uh, that we mentioned uh, and just started learning about last uh, Sunday, and that was uh, King Saul. King Saul and how God um, had chosen King Saul um, because the Israelites uh, had rejected you know, everything that God had wanted, and they demanded a king. They wanted a king like all the other nations, like all the other people. And so God put Saul in charge. God put Saul in charge. And, and in the Bible story that we're going to hear today, God rejected that king. Though. God rejected Saul as king. Now, why would he do that? Why would God reject him? Well, let's find out. Because all, by all appearances, Saul was a good choice to be king. He was tall, he was handsome, and he was blessed by God. But Saul forgot that his kingship was from God. And boys and girls, doesn't that sound familiar with the Israelites specifically? What, would, what have we been studying through Judges? Do you remember? The Israelites, they would be loved by God, they would be cared for by God, they would call upon His name and they would be saved. Uh, from uh, the hands of their enemies, but all of a sudden they started to become comfortable and complacent, and they would say, you know what? We don't even remember this God anymore. We want to worship other things. We want to worship ourselves. And, and so they began to forget about God and reject God and put Him away. But it was in those moments that God's judgment would come upon them to redirect them, to refocus them back to himself. And so that's exactly here what was happening to Saul. Saul was a mighty king. Things were going well. And then all of a sudden, Saul began to forget where his kingship came from. It came from God. And Saul made some mistakes. He made some sinful decisions that cost him his throne. Now, have any of you ever made some wrong choices? <laughs> that, that might seem like a silly question because we all know that's true. We all know that's true. I know in my own life that I have made some very sinful choices. I have made some wrong choices. And the, the thing that comes with those sinful choices are some pretty bad consequences, right? We have to deal with the consequences, the, the effects of what come from those sinful choices and decisions. It's kind of like these. Let's, let's think through just a list of, of some things of like sinful choices and the consequences of that. Let's, 
let's consider this. Maybe let's say you ate too many cookies. Well, what would happen? I know that none of you would eat too many cookies. <laughs> well, you most likely would get a stomach ache, right? You are going to feel the consequences, the effects of eating too many cookies. And you're going to say, oh, my tummy hurts. Oh, it's, oh, I don't know what happened. And mom and dad are going to be like, well, you shouldn't have eaten so many cookies. Or maybe you never brush your teeth. Ooh, please don't talk to me if you never brush your teeth. You would end up with what if you never brush your teeth? you would end up with lots of cavities. That's right. You would end up with lots of cavities and you have to go to the dentist and they have to drill on your teeth and put in that stuff. And oh man, is not something comfortable and not something that you want to endure. Those are consequences to not brushing your teeth. Well, or maybe you stayed up really late. You stayed up past midnight at some point and you're just so tired the next morning, right? The consequences of staying up late would be the next day you were just so tired and maybe you forget to do something that you were supposed to do or maybe you oversleep and you, you forgot um, to wake up and go to that thing that you were so looking forward to. Or what about this? Maybe you disobeyed your parents. Oh, man, that would be a bad thing, right? Have any of you had to endure the consequences of disobeying your parents? I'm sure all of you have. Your parents would most likely punish you, right? They might would take something away from you. They might would um, not allow you to have treats or ice cream or dessert for a week. Or maybe they would spank you. They would... Um, uh, uh, make sure that something that was coming up that you were looking forward to, maybe they would withhold that from you as a consequence to your sinful actions, your sinful decisions by disobeying them. Boys and girls, these are all examples of the consequences of bad choices, bad choices that are made because a wrong choice was made. Undesirable consequences happened as a result. Because of our sin, we have to face the consequences of those choices. And today we're going to hear a Bible story about a king, King Saul, who sinned by not necessarily disobeying his parents, but disobeying God, disobeying his heavenly father. Well, there will be some heavy consequences for his poor choices well, turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And this is where Saul sinned by burning offerings in Samuel's absence. And in that moment, uh, this was an important test for Saul. Now, according to Samuel, the Lord would have permanently established Saul's reign if Saul had obeyed here. So one choice, one choice that Saul made, and all of a sudden, that, each, that, uh, that permanent reign that he was going to have is pulled away, is rejected because of one decision. And boys and girls, as we read the story, it's going to sound like, well, why didn't he just wait a little bit longer? Why didn't he obey God? Well, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 13, and read about this account of Saul and what happened. So look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 42 years over Israel. Now, that's a long time. He chose 3,000 men from Israel for himself, 2,000 were the, with Saul at Michmash and in Bethel's hill country, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. He sent the rest of the troops away, each to his own tent. 
Jonathan attacked the Philistines. Uh, uh, Jonathan attacked the Philistines garrison that was in Gibeah, and Philistines heard about it. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, "Let the Hebrews hear." And all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine garrison, and Israel is now repulsive to the Philistines. And then the troops were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Now the Philistines also gathered to fight against Israel. Three thousand chariots, six thousand horsemen, and troops as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. Now the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. And they hid in caves and thickets, among rocks and in holes and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to, land of, to the land of Gad and Gilead. And Saul, however, was still in Gibgal, and all his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the troops were, des were deserting him. Now, boys and girls, we could look at this picture and say, well, Saul was getting scared because his troops, his army, was starting to desert him, starting to run away, and he was supposed to wait on Samuel, but Samuel was not there in the amount of time that he said that he would be there. However, he was supposed to wait on Samuel. So let's read what happens. Verse 9, So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him, and Samuel asked, What have you done? Saul answered, When I saw that the troops were deserting me, and you didn't come within the appointed days, and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought, the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal, and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. So I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Well, boys and girls, Saul was afraid, Saul was scared, and he had reason to be, but he was supposed to trust the Lord, even in this time, and obey God no matter what. You may have been in a situation like that where your mom or dad said, I need you to stay right here. Do not move until I come to get you. And you might have been getting afraid and scared and, and you, just, you just couldn't wait any longer. So you go and you try and find mom and dad, but then you can't find them. And then mom and dad probably go back to get you and you're not there. Oh man, that, that's a disaster waiting to happen, right? Well, that's, that's kind of like what happened here with Saul. Saul was supposed to obey God, was supposed to follow and let Samuel make that sacrifice. But Saul was saying, I, I don't know if I can trust him. I don't know if he's coming and I need to make this offering before the Lord so that I can have God's favor so that I won't be overtaken by this Philistine army so that we would not be um, uh, destroyed. Saul even says, so I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Look at verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, You have been foolish. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Man, boys and girls, Saul sinned again. And you know, here he sinned, and he didn't obey God. He didn't do what God commanded him to do. 
and it cost him his kingship. Where does the kingship come from? It came from God. And God had the, had the, uh, the right to take that away. And that's exactly what happened to Saul. Now, is God just in removing his kingship? Yes, he is. God is perfect and just in all that he does. And that's exactly what happened to Saul. Saul made a wrong choice. He made a sinful choice. He, he chose not to trust the Lord in that moment. He chose not to obey, even though he knew that's what was right. And Samuel says, you've made a poor choice. Oh, foolishness. God, who would have permanently established your reign over Israel, your reign will not endure any longer. God has found a new man to take the job of king. And boys and girls, this wasn't the last time that Saul sinned. What happens further? Saul sinned again. He sinned again. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel told Saul, verse 1, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, Israel. Now listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies says. I witnessed what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way as they were coming out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare, the, um, do not spare them. Kill men, women, infants, nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. Then Saul summoned the troops, counted them at Telaim, and 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men went from Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set up an ambush in the wadi. Now, boys and girls, Saul is given another task here. He's getting given another responsibility, another job. And he is given the responsibility of going in and to destroy these people, to destroy what, um, uh, what was before them. And he goes and he says in verse 3, I want you to uh, destroy everything. I want you to, to attack the Amalekites, and I want you to completely destroy them. The men, the women, the infants, the nursing babies, the oxen, the sheep, the camels, and donkeys. Now that's everything. He's covering it all. He's not saying it's okay just to go in and, and to get rid of all the powerful um, bad people that are in there, the strong men with, that are warriors, or to destroy the armies, or to destroy the, uh, the garrisons, or anything like that. He's saying everything needs to go. Whew. Let's see what happens. So verse 6, He warned the Kenites, Since you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt, go on and leave. Get away from the Amalekites, or I'll sweep you away with them. So the Kenites withdrew from the Amalekites. Then Saul struck down the Amalekites from Havilah, all the way to Shur, which is next to Egypt, he captured, he captured King Agag of Amalek alive, but he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and his troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else, they were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Verse 12, Early in the morning, Samuel got up to confront Saul, but it was reported to Samuel, Saul went to Carmel, where he set up a monument for himself. 
Then he turned around and went down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Boys and girls, had Saul carried out the Lord's instructions? No, he didn't. Verse 14, Samuel replied, Then what is this sound of sheep, goats, and cattle here? Saul answered, The troops thought... Um, the, the troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we destroyed. Stop, exclaimed, exclaimed Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, he replied. Verse 17, Samuel continued, Although you once considered yourself unimportant, have you not become the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, Go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission of the Lord that he gave me. I brought back King Agag of Amalek, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. The troops took sheep, goats, and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for the destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Verse 22, Then Samuel said, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the Lord, the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your words. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin and return with me so I can worship the Lord. Samuel replied to Saul, I will not return with you because you rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And when Samuel turned to go, Saul grabbed the corner of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingship of Israel away from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Furthermore, the eternal one of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not man who changes his mind. Saul said, I have sinned. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so I can bow and worship to the Lord your God. Then Samuel went back following Saul, and Saul bowed down to the Lord. Samuel said, Bring me King Agag of Amalek. Agag came in trembling, for he thought certainly the bitterness of death has come. Samuel declared, As your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. Then he hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord of Gilgal. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his own to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Even to the day of his death, Samuel never saw Saul again. Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted he had made Saul king over Israel. Boys and girls, you may have been in a position where um, you had been given instructions. You had been given a direction of, of what you were supposed to do. 
And in doing that, maybe you thought, well, hey, actually, let's do it this way. Or, or you know, it'd be better if I kept some of these things, even though mom and dad said to get rid of them. Is that obeying mom and dad? Is that obeying the instructions you were given? No, it's not. And that's what Samuel was dealing, or that's what Saul was dealing with here. Saul was supposed to obey God all the way. But then he thought, hey, What's wrong with worshiping the Lord? What's wrong with making a great sacrifice to God? And we've got these animals, and, and uh, they're good. They're good animals. They're in perfect condition. God would be pleased with this. But boys and girls, he didn't obey God's command. Samuel, or Saul in that moment, thought, I've got a better idea than God. You know, why would God want to waste all this stuff? Maybe he just doesn't know. Oh, God knows. If God had wanted those animals, he would have told Saul to keep those animals. If God wanted him to keep Agag alive and to bring him to him, God would have told him to do so. But he hadn't, and Saul disobeyed. When Samuel arrived, Saul proudly said, I've carried out everything yet God told me to do. And Samuel had to say, Saul, you have done everything wrong really you haven't obeyed god and he goes on and he tells saul to obey is better than sacrifice because you have rejected the word of the lord he has rejected you as king boys and girls we can think sometimes that we're doing something good but we may be disobeying god while doing that good thing and that completely cancels it out. It's better to obey God to the fullest degree than to be obeying and doing something, but also being sinful while doing it as well. After they returned to Israel, Samuel never visited Saul again. This is a sad, sad situation. Saul made some sinful decisions that cost him his throne. God would not bring him back to that kingship, and God rejected Saul as king because of his sin. Now, what was the first mistake that he made? He offered sacrifice when he wasn't supposed to. Samuel was supposed to do the sacrifice, not Saul. And what was the other mistake that he made? When Israel attacked the Malachites, Saul did not destroy everything that he was supposed to destroy. And why was Saul not supposed to give an offering to the Lord? Only the priests were supposed to give an offering to the Lord. And what did Saul keep from the Amalekites? He kept all the good sheep, and goats, and animals, all those things. And he kept King Agag. Saul didn't obey God. He disobeyed God. He made excuses for his disobedience. Boys and girls, do we make excuses? Yeah, we do. Saul did not stop being king right away. God was going to choose someone else to be king over Israel. And God requires total obedience to his commands. But we know we do not obey God completely. And God knows that we don't obey him completely. Boys and girls, we don't realize, even in our own hearts, how not completely we obey God. We don't know how bad we really are, is what I'm trying to say. But you know, God, in His steadfast love, in His mercy, and in His grace, He has provided a perfect king, not just for Israel, but for us as well. He has provided someone that would save us from our sinfulness, from making those sinful decisions, and that is King Jesus. So our big question is, who is our king? Who is our king? What's the answer? Our king is King Jesus. Our king is King Jesus. Jesus is our king forever, and he rules over the world. When we trust in Jesus, God does not reject us. Well, let's look at our verse that we 
um, our memory verse. You'll see it up on your screen. It's Isaiah 33, 22. It says, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. Boys and girls, this, this verse reminds us that God is in control over all these things, and Jesus is the perfect king for us. He will rule. He will reign, and he will do that perfectly, unlike Saul unlike the king of the, of the Israelites. He fulfilled God's law to the fullest degree, and he did it perfectly for us so that we could be saved, so that we could be uh, counted as righteous before the Lord because of Christ's righteousness. We, he is worthy to be praised because of that. And we can sing Psalm 118.1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His love, steadfast love. We can rightly exclaim that as well. Let's pray. Father, thank You for allowing us to worship You rightly, even now. And we do that because of what Your Son, Jesus, our King Jesus, has done for us. Help us to continue to turn our hearts and minds upon you. Lord, I pray for these children. I pray, God, that, that you would work in their hearts and minds, helping them to see their own sin, that even at times when they think they're doing good or they think they're doing um, right before you, that their own sin can uh, encroach upon those things and they can overtake instead of obeying fully they they do things that they were not commanded to do or told to do lord i pray that you'll um, help these children to do what is right but only because they are following after you and because maybe you have supplied them with the faith to trust upon you to save them through the work of the spirit in their own lives god they desire uh, to love you, and um, I pray that you would help them to do that rightly and do that well. Thank you for loving us because we couldn't love you unless you first loved us, Father. We give praise to you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us again today, boys and girls, and I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. I'm praying for you, and I love you, and uh, uh, have a good rest of your day and wonderful week. Take care.